Recovery Sort Of is a podcast where we discuss recovery topics from the perspective of people living in long-term recovery. This podcast does not intend to represent the views of any particular group, organization, or fellowship. The attitudes expressed are solely the opinion of its contributors. Be advised, there may be strong language or topics of an adult nature. Welcome back. Recovery sort of. I think I was really loud doing that. I don't know why I felt like screaming, but I'm Jason, a guy in recovery. And I'm Billy. I'm a person in long-term recovery. And we're going to have Y12SR, Yoga of 12-Step Recovery on today. I heard about this like a year ago. It's weird. So I think of, I lived in Baltimore for so long and I just like, oh yeah, we, we have everything here, right? And I'm like, I'm going to go to Cecil County. They don't have good fast food places like none of that shit exists there right they don't have anything and then i come up here and i hear about all these weird things like recovery dharma and y12 sr and i'm like where the where the fuck is this stuff from like i've never heard of, and i didn't know what to make of it but everybody knows about it up here apparently yeah i was introduced to it I, it's been a year well it's probably been two years ago through a recovery event there was a recovery event at a local community park and a lady in our area that was putting on a Y12SR or hosting, I guess they call it, a Y12SR group came to the event, donated some uh, yoga sessions along with the 12YSR, mm. and, you know, it was great. It was a, we went to, she did a session there that day, and then she, we went to a session at her yoga studio, and it was pretty interesting. That's awesome. So is it like step one, downward dog, step two, tree pose, step three, child's pose, like... <laughs> sort of yeah i mean it was a little more basic because it when we went it was still a fairly new concept to most of us so everything was very basic yes i, I mean i at this point in my life knowing that like uh you know some of the experts in research on trauma are talking about these ancient movements that we do um that we're noticing that people have done for thousands and thousands of years and how they're actually super helpful for healing trauma and get us so uh, I don't want to get too deep into this, but basically trauma happens and your body has the memory stored in it separate from the narrative portion of your brain's ability to tell memory. And so what happens is you have feelings that aren't attached to any words and you don't understand. They're just kind of floating around. You're like, oh my God, I'm anxious and I don't get why, right? Mm. Or you have the other experience where you have an actual memory of something really horrific, but you just tell it straight face and deadpan. And you're like, yeah, it happened. And no feelings attached whatsoever because there's a disconnect there. And the, the, the yoga world, the Tai Chi world, these ancient movements bring some of that back together. Um, you know, they, they heal kind of the, the body piece of it, the sensory piece of it. Um, and, and sometimes can help us put all the stuff back together. EMDR is another therapy modality that helps with that. But it's all about healing that body memory that really has nothing. You can't really talk through it because it's not attached to the talky understanding portion of your brain, <laughs> which is a weird concept. But I, it's like we're getting there with the research that that's the direction we're going with it. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, we, we talk about, you know, the disease of addiction being like a physical, mental, spiritual disease. And for me, it's like each of those is its own independent and isolated thing. Like it's got its own category and its own practice of healing. And this these concepts seem more into like tying those things together, mm. making like a whole a whole person. And for my compartmentalization brain, like that's really difficult to want to do. <laughs> you got to put your corn in your mashed potatoes. Yeah. Belly. I can't be mixing my things <laughs> together. They can't be mixed. You got to put your carrot pieces in your jello. The gym is for the physical <laughs> aspects of my disease. You know, I, you bring that up and it is interesting that, that, you know, we went to this 12 step program and we go, but we go to this 12 step program and they say, Hey, it's a physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional disease. We're going to work on the mental part. Right, right we're going to ignore all those <laughs> other pieces. Go out there and work on the rest of that crap. You need crap. to do them, but we just, we're not going to talk about that. You'd think they would that. incorporate more of that uh, in there. It would make sense. I mean, I guess it attacks the spiritual. You're kind of trying to get a relationship with a higher power of some sort. Yeah, and it does recommend prayer and meditation once you get to 11, but I mean, three-quarters of the people never make it there. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
and you're doing the mental because you're doing the steps and writing about it. Uh, was and I guess the emotional was supposed to come out in the steps. If you make it to four or five, they definitely never touch the physical portion though. No, I don't know. Why. Other than abstinence, maybe that doesn't count. That's yeah. not actually. Doing I don't know anything. that that's really healing. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a start. <laughs> yeah, it's better <laughs> I, than you. I surely <laughs> wasn't healing when I was still damaging. That's yeah, for that's sure. Yeah, that's true. Uh, no, but I, okay. So I think yeah, this will be interesting. We got the founder of Y Twelve SR, Nikki Myers, is going to come on and and talk about it and describe it. So that way, for anybody who's interested, we can try it out. You know, I I think for me, if I had had like an ability to listen to some of these programs being described before I went, I might have went. I was yeah, like, right. I was like, Alan, Alan sounds scary. Like I don't want to. <laughs> they might do weird stuff there. I don't. What if they asked me to talk when I walk in, right? And if they'd have just been on a podcast and been like, yeah, dude, you just come in and sit down like anywhere else. I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. I can right. go to al -Anon. I don't know. So hopefully we'll find out some of that stuff and uh, just excited to talk to Nikki. And we'll have her on now. Okay, so we're here with the founder of Y12SR, Nikki Myers. If you don't know what Y12SR is, because you've never heard of it, that is Yoga of 12-Step Recovery, which was new to me when I heard of it not that long ago. Uh, and so generally, Nikki, uh, welcome for one. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. I'm great today. Thank you very much. Excellent. That's awesome. So we generally start whenever we have a program on, we figure the best thing is to give you like five to eight minutes just to tell us your story and version of it. Well, five to eight minutes. I <laughs> know, oh, condensed. Ten. Do you something. know how old I am? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I usually start really whenever um, in, in a work context in particular, no matter where I am, I, I do the same thing. And the running joke always was, I used to say, if I was ever speaking at Harvard Medical School, I would introduce myself the same way. And then three years ago, I spoke at Harvard Medical School. <laughs> so I got, the, I got the chance to do it. And it's, hi, I'm Nikki. I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a codependent. I'm the survivor of both childhood and adult sexual trauma. I'm a love addict. I'm a recovering debtor spender and, and the big three letter word is and, right? The big three letter word is and. And a lot of what Y12SR is about is bridging that and. So for me, on the other side of that and is I am a yoga therapist. I'm a somatic experiencing practitioner. Somatic experiencing is the trauma healing methodology that was developed by Dr. Peter Levine. So I'm grateful to have done all that work and to, to be in that work. I am an MBA. I am the mother of two living and one deceased child. I'm the grandmother of five. I'm actually the great grandmother of three. I've got three beautiful great grandchildren. And I love seeing all that in the same sentence. Right. And part of the whole path of healing has uh, in continually in the whole path of healing has been this. Right. I've discovered and yoga pieces was a big part of this for me. I've discovered when I make one part of myself bad, awful and wrong and another part of myself right and wonderful and praiseworthy, what gets created inside is a split that there's this internal war that goes on. And that separation, that internal war is really the antithesis of, of yoga. Yoga means union. It means integration. It means wholeness, right? So this whole part of this journey has been accepting and welcoming and bringing in all parts of myself in, in, uh, in a way that doesn't make one bad, awful, and wrong, and the other right and wonderful, and any of those kinds of things. So the journey has been, part of the journey is everyone gets to play, right? We all get to play and come in here. So it's been this integration process. Um, you know, and I love saying it all now, and I say it all with gratitude and grace. I'm grateful for every single part of this journey. 
And, you know, what was uh, a, a, a period in my life of destruction and chaos and all the things that addiction brings, that has now turned into the gift of my life. Right, it empowers and and really is the basis for who I am and what I who and how I relate in the world today. So, um, so I'm grateful for it all. And long story short, because like I said, this could really get long with this. Um, I um, jails, institutions, and death. Right, I know a lot of people know those phrases. I know them all, right? <laughs> Jails, institutions, and death. Um, uh, the, through the throes of addiction, I mean, I was in commercial sex work. I was in all of those things, the whole nine yards with, with all of it. Um, and then uh, the death was actually, the way I love to speak of it was the death of my own soul. When I did walk into the rooms of a 12-step program, which was in um, 1987, I first walked into the rooms of a 12-step program. And when I walked in there, you know, it, it, it truly was, um, uh, I was spiritually bankrupt. I was, um, um, I couldn't put a sentence together, barely put a sentence together. And uh, found in there people who really did love me till I could learn how to love myself, right? And walked me back into things. So part of the story with me was I stayed clean for eight years, the first eight years of recovery. And started, you know, things started going well in one perspective. Um, I got my kids had been separated from me. So I got my kids back over the course of those eight years. I got the car back and the house back and the, you know, all that stuff. Great job. Went back to school, got a master's degree. Matter of fact, got straight A's through the whole thing. So I didn't destroy all the brain cells, right? <laughs> right. And that, in the whole trip, I didn't destroy them all. Anyway, um, uh, all of that was going on. And after eight years, I relapsed, right? And um, uh, I happened to relapse. Where the relapse happened was out of the country, right? And so um, I, I started out in one place in Europe and then found my way to Amsterdam. So you can only imagine... <laughs> You know that part of the story, right? <laughs> that was like the the fantasy as a teenager was like to leave the U.S. and go to Amsterdam. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I did it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, you know, uh, uh, I'm in the throes of my addiction. There, I finally make it back home. By this time, I had moved away from um, where I live now, right, where I grew up, which is Indianapolis, Indiana. And um, I was living on the East Coast in Boston. And so I made it back finally to the East Coast and made it back into the rooms, right? And so this was after eight years clean, right? Eight years clean. So I make it back into the rooms. And it was shortly after being back that I was kind of reintroduced to yoga. And because uh, I had been introduced to it earlier in life. But this time I got really serious about it, right? As I'm coming out of this relapse. And uh, first introduced to a practice called Bikram, which is hot yoga. And then was introduced to a practice called Ashtanga. And I fell in love with that practice. I just fell in love with that practice. And um, started really getting deep in the philosophy, in, the, in, in um, the physical practice, the whole nine yards. And again, long story short, right? I start deciding that, you know, I'm reading yoga philosophy and all this and, I, you know, flipping pages and books and I'm going, damn, that sounds like the 12-step program, right? And I read another sentence and go, damn, that sounds like the 12-step program, right? And so 
I made this decision that maybe I didn't need a 12-step program anymore, right? That I was sick of hearing the same shit in those rooms all the time, over and over and over again. I didn't need that. Right now, I had this yoga thing. So four years after that, right, I relapsed again. I relapsed again. So I relapsed twice. Eight years the first time, four years the second time. And it was after that second experience of relapse that I recognized that at least for someone like me, an addict like me, that these two things needed to be deeply coupled, that they needed to be deeply combined. What I had done is compartmentalize things and put things in boxes, right? And I knew after that second relapse that there was a component missing for me, right? That there, I had been all in my head about all of this stuff and that there was another component that wasn't being addressed. And it had to do with the body that, you know, we say trauma really lives in our bodies, right? So it had to do with the body that wasn't being uh, addressed in a, in a way that could really bring healing for me. And um, there wasn't anything about what connects the mind and the body, right? That these were the pieces that were missing. And I gotten some of this in yoga, right? I had the cognitive pieces from the 12 step program and why 12 SR was born when we combined the cognitive and somatic, because that's what it is, right? It's the combination of those things. Um, and that was in um, 2000, the first why 12 SR program was in 2004. It was actually born and conceived in 2003, but the first one was 2004. And what I found is that there are a lot of folks just like me, right? That there is this other component that just can support more sustainable recovery, right? Long-term sustainable recovery, there's another component. The way that we often talk about this from, particularly from yoga pro philosophy pieces, the yogis, the ancients speak of, we have five bodies. There, there's not just one, that there's five. So there's the physical, there's the emotional, there's the mental, there's the character and the heart, right? And the heart being the spiritual heart rather than the blood pump, right? And what the yogis say is that, you know, while those need to be in a place of integration, that they need to be in a place that they're really not separate things at all, when they are aligned, when our five bodies are aligned, when there's a sense of, of connection uh, between them, then we walk more in a state of wholeness. When they're misaligned, or disconnected or any of that, then it's much easier for dysfunction to enter in this multi-dimensional system. So it, the whole idea was to support and have tools that address all five of those bodies, you know, rather than just being uh, focused on the mind and the cognitive pieces, right? Instead, to really have tools that address all five of those bodies, to work to bring back into um, a place of integration, right? A place of connection. And so why 12 sr and what we do is one of the tools in a sustainable platform for, for recovery. And like I said, I'm so grateful to say, you know, for someone like me in July of 2020, I celebrated 20 years since that last relapse. I mean, yeah. yeah. And for me, it's been the depth of adding in some other pieces, right? Some other pieces. I'm still deeply involved in 12 steps. I believe the 12 steps are brilliant brilliant right they really are they're brilliant and 
there's some ways in my experience to even deepen and adding in this body connection, right? Adding in this breath connection has been, has deepened my, my uh, understanding and application of 12 steps in a way that, you know, I didn't even know it was possible. I always say the 12 step program saved my life and it did, and I'm so deeply grateful, right? I mean, it saved my life. So it's been like a lifeboat for me, but yoga has been a launching pad. It's taken my recovery to a place I didn't even know was possible, right? It's just, just my recovery, taking it to a height that I didn't even know was possible. So, you know, I'm deeply grateful. Yeah, deeply grateful. So that was the long version. <laughs> that, that was close, that was close. <laughs> So, and, and sitting here talking with Nikki and, and it's the gorgeous Nikki who's vibrant and energetic and lively. And then I find out she has great grandkids and I've never been sold on yoga more than this moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, that, that must work. Yeah. I would not believe you had grandkids. That's amazing. <laughs> great, grandkids. great grandkids. Yeah. Great grand. That's what I meant. Great grandkids. I'm sorry. Incredible. Um, and so. It's interesting. I, I mean, I know this research has been going on behind the scenes for a while. Um, so I'm a, I'm a mental health practitioner myself. And so we believe in breathing, mindfulness at the bare minimum. And then you have whole offshoots of, you, you know, styles of therapy, like uh, internal family systems, which talks yeah. about the different parts of self, which kind of ties into the five different pieces you were talking about and sensory motor psychotherapy, which is about the movement and polyvagal, which is you know, all this stuff that all really that ties into what you're saying. Right. And, and like, that's pretty new. So you stumbling upon the yoga experience as a healing for trauma. I mean that, you know, you beat Bessel van der Kolk and his body keeps the score by a couple years. Um, but that's, that's incredible that like you were, I guess on this page at the same time they were discovering this page really. Yeah. Um, um, you know, but this stuff is ancient, right? True. This yoga is 5,000 years old, right? So, or something like that. This stuff is really ancient. And really, if you do research and you go back some ways, you can very easily see how the founders of the 12-step program played in this a, a little bit, mm. right? They really, really did. Now, and I can only imagine what that must have been like in 1935 when 12 Steps was born, right? If, it, if you think it's woo-woo now, right? <laughs> you can only imagine... <laughs> You can only imagine what it might have been like then. Um, but you can see that that there are really, really some unbelievable connections between 12 steps and yoga philosophy and then adding in the yoga practices with it has been, um, you know, it's been phenomenal. And yeah, it kind of, it kind of um, in some way precedes um, um, at least the popularization of Bezel's work and of Peter Levine's work mm -hmm. and of, you know, um, Stephen Porges' work about the vagus nerve mm -hmm. and all of those kinds of things. But the yogis were talking about the vagus nerve a long, long time ago, right? They didn't have the tools to do the kind of you know, delving in that we can now that I know of, and I have no idea how they knew it, but they knew some shit about this, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and you, what you talk about, I mean, Tai Chi, like an ancient practice of That's movement right. and spirituality and getting in tune with yourself. And it's like somehow we get too smart and forget these things over That's time. That's right. Well, can I ask a, a more oh, basic yeah. question? So I'm somewhat very minor uh introductions to yoga i've done i think two or three classes and one of them was through a, a y12 sr I love it. class so i just always sort of knew it as like i looked at it as almost like an exercise but it sounds like obviously there's a lot more to it it sounds a lot more ancient you know with the philosophies and things is would you describe uh yoga is more of a is it like a religious or spiritual practice is it a martial art is it a philosophy like what yeah, exactly yeah 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 um 
Um, the spirituality piece of it, yes, it is a spiritual practice. Spiritual, though, in the sense of my internal spirit, right? From a yoga philosophy point of view, right? And I always think of this when I, with my great grandchildren. I have one that was just born, right? And she's now four months old. But there's, and, and the older one, I have a picture of me holding her at two hours old, at two hours old. And I'm looking at this child going, this is wholeness. This is what, she's a little piece of wholeness that is extracted from wholeness. That's exactly what she is. And that's exactly what we all are, right? We're a little piece of wholeness extracted from wholeness. And then what happens is when we come into this plane of existence, right? At first, she can't tell herself from anything. She doesn't know herself from anything, right? But then we start getting all this programming. We start this programming that goes on, right? And program, they talk about the mass, right? And the things that, that we put on. We get told, okay, you're a girl. So girls do this, girls don't do that, right? Or you get told, like in my case, you're black. Black fits in this box. I speak of this as like the matrix. We come into the matrix. And the matrix is binary. This is good. This is bad. This is right. This is wrong. This is inferior. This is superior. And we get programmed into this. And what that does is cover up our wholeness. We get all this shit dumped on top of our wholeness, right? And what the yogis want to offer, and I assert the 12 step too, is in many ways the same thing, is examining all that conditioning that gets put on top of us so we can come back to our wholeness, right? And what yoga offers is a whole set of tools, a whole set of, of you know, all of that. With the, with the intent in mind of bringing us back to who it is that we really are without all this program and stuck on top, right? And it's a whole set of tools that goes with that. And the asana piece, working with the body is one piece. Working with mind is another piece, right? Working with um, qualities and character like we do in 12 step, that's another piece, right? So there are all these pieces involved in order to hopefully get us back to to our original wholeness who it is that we really are hmm. awesome awesome yeah I, holy as in put a w on the front of that <laughs> holy <Yeah. laughs> um so when we talk about the y12 sr program for anybody who's never heard of it is this something that people could do all by itself as a program or does it work best in conjunction with another 12 step going on somewhere else? Yeah, we usually describe it as an adjunct, right? Okay. It's another piece of a platform, um, you, you know, and something in your platform may need to address the cognitive pieces. 12 steps or cognitive behavioral therapy or, you know, any of the other kind of programs like that, that really, really go at that from, from that perspective, mm -hmm. that are really looking at it from the cognitive perspective. For many people, they need something like that for a sustainable platform for recovery, for long-term recovery. Um, um, there are a lot of people that come to Y12 SR for whatever reason, may have had um, an experience that they deemed less than, than whole, less than good at a 12 step meeting, right? And, you know, if it, here's the truth, right? We know the deal on that, right? That um, 12 steps, some 12 step meetings, some are the most wonderful in, in on the planet, but there are others that I can see how someone may have had an off-putting experience relative to, uh, to a specific meeting. 
that doesn't make 12 step bad. Just like, you know, there's some yoga classes and yoga practices, same thing, or church, same thing, right? You can have a bad experience in any in anything. So it's not, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water <laughs> as far as that goes with that. But there are people that come to Y12 SR that have had that experience. And usually it's like, you know, they recognize that there's something in those 12 steps, right? That there's a path toward healing in those 12 steps. But because of whatever experience they might have had, have decided they're not doing that. They're, they're, you know, they're not going that route, right? So we see a lot of that in 12 steps, right? We also see um, um, a lot of people who have started the yogic path, right? And have found out, have recognized that, you know, um, whatever it is that they're doing, right? The bottle of vodka they're drinking every night or whatever it is that they're doing is, is and they can't quit, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and they've said, well, this, this habit, right, that I'm in, I can't break it. So this dysfunctional pattern is stronger than my intention, right? They have the intention to do something, but their dysfunctional pattern is keeping them from achieving what it is that they really want. And we see a lot of that in Juan Travisar, right? Yogis who want to quit, for example, smoking weed or whatever it is, but uh, haven't been able to do it. So they come to Y12SR, right? It's this bridge in order to work through what it is, how their dysfunctional patterns are stronger than their intentions, right? <laughs> This episode has been brought to you in part by Voices of Hope, Inc., a nonprofit recovery organization made up of people in recovery, family members, and allies. Together, members strive to protect the dignity of those that use drugs and those in recovery by advocating for treatment, harm reduction and support resources, and mentoring. Please visit us at www.voicesofhopemaryland.org and consider donating to our calls. So and, and that's it. So I remember when I first heard about Y twelve SR. My first initial thought, because I, I have really goofy thoughts at times, I was like, so like every step you work is a certain pose. Like, do I do tree for step one? Or, <laughs> and I had no real understanding of what it meant. Yeah. Is there a specific way that you kind of work steps through the yoga? Not really. Okay. What we work the way that we work this is that. The reason for working steps is to get at and embody and really live the spiritual principles that sit underneath the steps, right? The last words of the 12 steps are practicing the principles in all our affairs, right? Mm -hmm. So what we key in on is what it means to practice principles, right? So the real work and what that really, and how I can feel it in my body. And I'll give you an example of that, right? You know, I was telling you I'm still um, very much involved in 12-step programs. And so I sponsor, right? Now it seems like all my sponsees are yoga teachers or yoga practitioners <laughs> or, or all that kind of stuff. And, and here's a little example. One of my sponsees one time called me up and they were in the middle of this very kind of vitriolic, kind of nasty divorce. And they called me up and they said, you know, I'm tired of this. I can't do it anymore. I'm sick of this. Da -da 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 -da. And you go going on and on and on and on. Right? And then she said, I surrender. <laughs> I like that. And I'm on the other end of the phone with her. And I'm going, hmm. And what I said is, does that feel like Shavasana? So Shavasana is the final relaxation pose in, in the practice. And usually it feels so good, right? Well, Shavasana is the embodiment of surrender. That's what surrender feels like, 
if it doesn't feel like that, it's not surrender. She was in resignation, right? She was resigned, right? And I can say, so it, it's a way to stop the bullshit, right? I can't bullshit myself when I can admit that this is what I feel in my body, right? So I can say, say nope, we can agree. It doesn't feel like Shavasana. And if it doesn't feel like Shavasana, it's not surrender. That's not surrender, right? And so, and all the spiritual principles have a sensate feeling associated with them. For another example, you may never know I'm being dishonest or lying, but I do, and mm. I feel that in my body. Right. There's a sin state feeling. There's really, you know, that, that is something I can feel. And so we bring people to that. So you can't bullshit yourself, right? You can't say, you know, rat, you talking radical honesty. If it doesn't feel like that in your body, you know that you're bullshit, right? And then tools to come back, tools to keep coming back, right? Using breath work, you know, and using all the tools and program to calling somebody, finding connection, all of those kinds of things. I, I find that fascinating because in uh, therapy sessions, when people are very disconnected from their feelings, we'll do exercises that are like, hey, let's be an actor or an actress and pretend what it would be like to be disappointed, right? And so we start to learn how these feelings feel in our body right. for when the moment happens. But I have never, ever thought about feeling a spiritual principle ahead of time. Right. Like, I've never considered it. That's right. That's, that's right. wild. So that's, that's what we teach to, right? So that hopefully in my walk in the world, right? Number one, when I'm triggered, right? There's some things that I know, first I recognize I'm triggered. Mm -hmm. And then there's some tools that I can use to come back to a sense of balance, mm -hmm. to come back to a sense of homeostasis in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's all that. That's so interesting. Are, I know there's some differences between your, well, I don't want to say your group, but Y12SR, uh, which you founded, and, you know, these anonymous 12-step fellowships that all seem to follow a similar model of, you know, we don't have ties to anything else. We don't have this. We don't have that. Very strong in traditions. I noticed uh, going through the Y12SR website, I didn't see any traditions. I did see that the, like there was some, hey, these are our friends in the world of the recovery and yoga community. Um is there a reason you didn't adopt the traditional model of having traditions and stick into that kind of concept? Right. Um, we did want to keep it generally different from that mm -hmm. because um, even though what a one to over star meeting looks like is a meeting and then a yoga practice. Right. The theme on Y12 is the issues live in our tissues. Right. That's Ooh. been our theme mm. forever. Right. And so we usually have a meeting, then a practice, or it can be a practice, then a meeting. And it doesn't matter which one, as long as the two are tied together. It doesn't matter which goes first or any of that. As long as there's this combination between the cognitive and the somatic. Right. That's really the, that's the juice. Right, it really is the juice in that. We did um, write the AA World Service Organization, who owns the steps, mm -hmm. and asked them, would it be okay if we use the steps as a, a model within that? And we got permission to use the steps, right? Um, uh, but we, we still, in, in that, well, just like a treatment center or anybody else, they use the steps. You ask for permission in order to use the steps. Um, but we wanted to keep it different. It's different, right? There's a whole, when you include the body in it, there's a whole um, a magnitude of difference, right? So we definitely wanted to keep it distinct from that. And we, well, all addictions are in the room at the same time. Right, which is another one of the powerful things that we found about Wantovasar. And I know there's some universal 12 step meetings, right? 
this one, it, it, it's really, you got A-A-N-A-O-A, S-L-A, I always say E-I-E-I-O, right? <laughs> in the, in the right. world, all at the same time. So, for example, some of the things we've seen relative to that, someone from, for example, the Al-Anon program, right? And they speak and they're talking about their experience and, you know, the whole nine yards. And then there's someone else in the room who is directly affected by the disease of addiction, substance or, you know, just directly affected. And um, oftentimes they'll go over to the person that's in Al-Anon. I've seen this so many times, it's not funny. And they'll say something like, you know, I was listening to you speak and now I get how my wife feels. Now I understand how, you know, my mother feels, right? Because you can't see the picture when you're in the frame, right? So you got all of these folks in the room at the same time, and you get to see that there's something that the substance or the behavior is like the tip of the iceberg. There's something else that's going on underneath there, right? There's a, a whole deeper level. And so um, there are countless times we'd see that kind of thing happen. And that's been a big benefit. Are there any, and, and this is maybe a portion where we get into a little more of the specifics of how the program works. Are there any qualifications for membership? Don't even need to be in recovery, so to speak. You could just no. want to do yoga. You know, we, we say this, we say that this program is for anyone, um, dealing with their own addiction or affected by the behavior of others, the addictive behavior of others. And if you think about that, right, I always say that was one of the most brilliant sentences I've ever written, right? <laughs> Just because who's left out of that? Right. There is no one that is left out of that. I mean, even if you're not directly affected, even at a societal level, we're all affected by this thing. We're all affected by it. And, you, you know, one of the deeper ways that we love, one of the things we love to do in Y12 SR is kind of broaden the definition of addiction, right? If you think about it, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing one of the, the classical texts of yoga, which is the Yoga Sutras, right? And I assert that, that the Yoga Sutras really basically say we're all addicted to the way we process our reality. We're all addicted to the way we process our reality, right? And so at, at some level, what we do in one of us are is just broad. Usually you think addiction and you think substance or behavior or, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, in, in reality, we all get addicted to how you know, our defenses and our, and, you know, our way of being. So we love right. to broaden the de definition, hopefully to bring a whole different level of healing. And, and so I know not everybody used the way I used, right? Because uh, I'm just picturing a Y12 SR meeting being in my neighborhood. Uh, you know, my drug use was pretty extreme. I, I, I might've said I was going to come. Uh, chances are I wasn't coming. <laughs> if I came once, I probably wasn't coming back just because I was a little preoccupied um mm -hmm. I, I know that's not everybody's picture some people oh, you know. but it's fine so I, I'm, right. over here. <laughs> I'm just curious how often have you seen people come in that are uh maybe not quite uh clean or sober yet that have found freedom to get clean or sober through y12 sr how have we, you seen that benefit them yeah i've seen it a lot mm -hmm. a lot yep um, very often, you know, and, and the answer is it depends. My teacher says that's the answer to everything, <laughs> right? So, uh, so if someone is still, uh, if they come into the space and, you know, they're, they're high or use it or something like that, we might ask them not to do the yoga practice if they're mm. physically impaired, right? Right. But, but. You know, if they want to stay and listen to the message of recovery, as long as it's not distracting for the rest of the folks and for the many in the room, they're more than welcome, 
to stay and listen to, you know, the message of recovery and things like that. I have seen this happen quite a bit, right? I, it's so funny because I recently got an, an email from someone who was kind of um, what I was describing a little bit earlier. They've been doing yoga for a long time and um, have having problems letting go of this dysfunctional behavior and things like that. Um, asking about coming to the training that we do uh, uh, around this. And I have seen many people um, get a whole new perspective, uh, a broader perspective from just being in, in that training and that connection and with, with that stuff. I've seen that many times. That's so incredible. Can you walk us through what it would be like for us to walk into a Y12 SR meeting, how that maybe looks in ways that are familiar and comfortable to a 12 step meeting and maybe in ways that it's completely different? Um, it's probably gonna feel really familiar and comfortable to those who are in the 12 step, uh, in, in a 12 step process, mm -hmm. a program. It looks like a 12 step meeting. We sit in a circle, mm -hmm. right? Somebody reads a format. Right, it's a little different than the format in a um, a twelve step meeting, but we read the steps, right? We read the steps in a, in a, a, a certain way. We um, describe the as humans, we're a vessel. This is a I'm a vessel for spirit and addiction. Turn my vessel upside down, right? Steps one through three are the steps that support turning that vessel back right side up, right? And so we read steps one through three in a group. Then we read steps four through nine in a group. And the, the metaphor there with the vessel is that even though my vessel was now back right side up, it was still full of shit because it had been upside down for, <laughs> for 30 years, right? right? So that's the work we do to sweep the vessel out and prepare it for sale, right? And then the last three steps, that's four through nine. And then 10 through 12 are the steps that give us you know, the, the 12 steps talk about these as the maintenance steps. We talk about them as the sustainability steps, the sustainability steps. And then, so we read the steps, right? We go through all that. We read our community agreements. They're the ground rules to help us stay safe, right, within this context that we're created. And then, so, and then there's, we usually open for topic, right? In the Watovisar meeting that I host, now it's online, on Monday nights, we're doing this series called Practicing the Principles, right? And so the topic is, a spiritual principle. We introduce in that its yogic counterpart and its meaning from a yogic perspective as well. We open it up for all the sharing. Everyone there shares. We do that at the end of the hour. We close the sharing and we get ready for our, our yoga practice, right? And that's, that's exactly how it works. And the way that we work with the body is the same way we work with that metaphor, the vessel and the steps. Steps one through three are foundation. So we work with foundation in the body, right? Whatever touches the earth is our base or foundation. So we want to have in whatever posture we're in, on the mat or off the mat in our life, right? We want to have a sense of foundation in our being. Right, connecting them with Mother Earth beneath us, all of that kind of stuff. And then we work core, right? Core is like the basic part of the steps. They're, they're often called the action steps, right? The action steps. In our body, that work is core, right? And so we do a lot of work with core, and really, core from a yogic perspective lives all over our body. Right. It's the part that we begin to reclaim ourselves, 
right? Because, you know, I, part of my reason for using in the first place, I wanted to be as far away from this body as I could possibly be. I wanted to get away, right? So we use this in this part to reclaim, right? Or be, reclaim ourselves. I left parts of myself out everywhere, fragmented out everywhere, right? So it's reclaiming all the parts of myself. You know, that's why I can say I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic, codependent, and, right, all the rest, all of those, right? All of those belong here. And then the last three steps are called the sustainability, the expression steps. And, you know, and so that whole idea is matching the way we work on the mat with those base, the basic way that the steps are set up, right? And those basic way that the steps are set up comes right out of, um, um, you know, uh, from AA, it, Joe and Charlie, remember, you, you ever hear Joe and Charlie, right? That's from the AA program, right? And they, they talk about, um, there's a book that outlines the steps is often used called um, the steps we took. And in that, that's the way Joe McQuinney describes the 12 steps. He breaks them up in those first three, four through nine, 10 through 12. And we work with the body the exact same way. That, so you're saying your meeting's more than an hour. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm always so resistant to that idea, even though I think it's needed. <laughs> but it's not just talking, right? right. So, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering how you got half hour of talking and half hour of yoga, and that was going to be enough. I, was, I knew there was a catch. No, but that's that's awesome. There and are, if, they're usually, most of them are an hour and a half. Mine, because I'm mouthy, as you can probably tell, are two hours. But right. most of them are usually an hour and a half. And it's half practice, half meeting, right? Whatever so, it is. So do they have the cigarette break in the middle like they have in the law? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting question, though, because I'm a, I, I find myself to be an outlier. I mean, I gave up smoking, but then I went back to vaping and whatever. But I would be a guy who would come to a Y12 SR meeting and then walk out and smoke and come back in and do <laughs> yoga. I, I bet you you don't find many people smoking in the yoga uh, practice, huh? You really don't, but you know, that's choice. So, you know, we do what we do until we recognize it doesn't serve us anymore. Right. Right. It's, yeah. No, it's, it's so hard to be in tune and see the effects of something and still continue it. It really is. I, I mean, I'm running and I can feel the lung effect of vaping. Like I already quit the cigars because I could tell that. And it's just like, every time I run, I'm like, damn it, I could not have this. <laughs> I could not deal with this, but I keep doing it. Um, see, that's, no, you what that's what we were talking about, right? You got one intention but this other thing is stronger than the intention, right? Right. And that, right. that's what we're speaking to. That's the question we all, how can my intention become stronger than my dysfunctional patterns? Mm. Right. And, and this is the work, you know, that's the work. You've actually made me super curious and I, I don't know how I didn't look it up before we started, but I want to read the 12 steps according to Y 12 SR because they, they sound like they're worded interestingly. That, well, they they look pretty much the same. A, a, one of the things, and you know, there's a ton now of folks that are doing white focus art. What we do is train others to go out and do this, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's plenty of choice. There's no dogma or, or any of that. Um, but for example, some of the things in that we found in the 12 steps that have been um, off-putting for, for people. Hmm. Um, number one is God, right? So some people have a, a real problem with that. So we've given people the choice. If you know that relates, go for it, right? But it, for example, at the one to our meeting that I hold space for, we substitute the word love for God, hmm. right? You know, every place in the 12 steps where it says God, we say love. 
you know, how can you argue with that? Even biblically, it says God is love. So <laughs> I buy in. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> right. And then the other place that um, and that takes care of it because the steps were so gender specific. Every, mm. you know, it was he, you know, God is we right. understand him. And, and, you know, we just saw how much that that really was a barrier for folks to really get at the depth of the steps. It was, you know, there was this obstacle you had to get over in order to do that. But otherwise, the steps are the same. It, you know, you say that, and I went to a fellowship at one point where they their wording was uh, God as we understood God to remove the gendering. Yeah. And yet it sounded so terrible. Yeah. <laughs> God as we understand God doesn't make much sense. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I didn't see anything on your website of this. There's no like promises that your, your program offers. There's no disease concept or definition of addiction. It's really less focused about the whys and hows and wheres and more about like, Hey, let's be here in this place of moving forward. Now, this is a tool, right? Mm. It's a tool for sustainable recovery, right? Right. It's, it really, really is the tool. And it, it, I love to speak of it from that perspective and, and particularly the idea back to that idea of broadening the definition of addiction, hmm. right? That this could be hopefully a tool we can even use to, to start to work with systemic addictions, right? Racism is an addiction. Sexism is an addiction. All of those. So we love to use these across this broad spectrum of, of possibilities for addiction. Right. I, I think that's great. We're, I know one of the things that we've gotten most out of, you know, opening our minds and doing this podcast and everything is just understanding that it's not, there's just no one way to do things, that's right. right? We need to include everybody and make ways that work for everybody. That's right. Uh, that's so, you described something uh, which I found kind of interesting when I mentioned the smokers <laughs> and the smokers not being so heavy into the yoga. Is there a type of person or, or something about a quality of a type of person that you find that Y12 SR works well for and maybe a kind that it doesn't? I mean, obviously, I think you think that smokers wouldn't come so much. <laughs> um it's not that I don't think that smokers wouldn't come so much. I would love, you know, as me, smokers is, you know, wanted to come, to absolutely come. Um, it, it's going to take a level of, specifically as you work with body, right? What, what I have found is that if, if I just continue to put, things that are supportive and healthy in and build that sooner or later, the rest of that shit drops away. Right. <laughs> and right. So, right. I would just do everything that I could to, to support smoker or whoever it is to keep coming back. It's that whole thing. You keep coming back. You keep coming back. And if you keep coming back, hopefully sooner or later the rest of the stuff all that stuff will drop away so it's not so much about um having anything relative to what you're putting uh, uh what you're bringing in is what we're putting in on top of it right so the rest of the nonsense drops away right the things that don't serve us right it's that split making the decision does this serve what I say is most important to me or does it not serve what I say is most important to me? And probably the most important thing that Y12SR does is creates the space to, so that I can cognitively make a choice, right? I can choose this neural pathway toward what serves what's most important to me versus going down that other neural pathway that I always went down before, right? right? And it creates enough space with the tools that now I can make a choice instead of being off to the races, right? So. Yeah, and I think we talked about something like that last 
week or something. I mean, what you said was the we have the space to make the difference and, you know, there's enough tools in place. But also, I think we were talking about nutrition at the time and just the idea that if you put, you know, five to seven servings of fruit and vegetables in your life per day, there's just not enough room for all that other stuff you're talking about, right? We don't have room to eat tasty cakes once we're full on fruits and vegetables. We don't have room to smoke once we're full on being busy with all these meditation, yoga, right? We're putting all these practices in. There's no space for the bullshit, like you said. There you go. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, And I'm going to fill that space with something. I might as well try to make it healthy things because if not, I go. consistently make bad choices. <laughs> And I'm used to those not turning out well. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think we've covered the basics. I think people out there definitely will have an understanding of what to expect if they wanted to attend this program and check it out. What's the website where they can find out where the meetings are and everything and more about it? It is Y12SR.com. And right, wow. and there's a tab there for meetings. Most of the meetings now, although, you know, now things are, are beginning to loosen up, but they've been online, right? So there are a ton of online meetings. And actually, that's been a great way. It's not my preference. You know, I miss being with folks, of course, yeah. you know, and all of that. And I can't wait to get back to it. But I have to say, this has been a gateway into some things that I didn't expect doing this stuff online. I mean, sometimes we have folks from all other countries on our meetings and, and things like that. So it's just been a way to really um, connect with some others in a, in, a, in a way that I didn't expect or didn't imagine relative to this. So there's been some good things about it. Even when things begin to open back up, I'm pretty sure we're going to still continue to offer the online pieces. It's a good way um, for someone who really wants to, you know, explore and see what y 12 is to go to one of the online meetings, right? I host one every Monday night, every Monday evening at six o'clock. And so if you go online, you'll see all the listings and you'll see that one there. So nice. And I know we're lucky. We have actually two meetings, I think, within a t 20 to 30 minute drive from we're in a small county in Maryland. And there at ah. least if, if it survived through the pandemic stuff, there was one happening in a town here in northeast Maryland. Uh, a lady started a Y12SR, and then in Newark, Delaware, there's a oh, Y12SR meeting. So, yeah, there are two meetings in our local area. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I love that. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I think the online version makes it highly accessible for people who want to check it out. Or, or you know, we talk about like that single parent early in recovery who That's doesn't right. have the ability to do anything with their kid. That's well, right. you can do this from home. That's right. Uh, Nikki, respectful of your time. I know you have to go and you have more of these meetings to do, but thank you so much for coming on. Yes, it was thank awesome. you. My pleasure. You're awesome. welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day, okay? All thank right. you. Bye. Bye. Did you like this episode? Share it with people you think might get something out of it. Check out the rest of our episodes at recoverysortof.com. Also, while you're there, you can find ways to link up with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, anything. We're always looking for new ideas. Got an idea you want us to look into? Reach out to us.